Hello, and welcome to this Bible study in preparation for at-home Sunday school, or just for our own individual study of Old Testament Bible history. If you haven't looked ahead already to see what today's lesson is, you can probably guess based on the picture behind me, we are going into the wilderness to a bush that does not burn up, but is definitely burning, and Moses at that bush, and God uh, speaking to him and ultimately calling him to be the leader of Israel to bring God's people out of Egypt. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we consider this portion of your word and this piece of your history in the, in the events of the world, particularly leading up to Jesus' birth and then also our redemption, be with us in this study of your word. Help us learn from these truths what you would have us learn. Open our hearts to hear, to understand, and then also to be able to convey these truths to our children. We ask this in your name. Amen. So for this account, we take a trip to Exodus chapter 3. And for those of you that are watching on video, we'll share that screen and pull up the, the text. So Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 20, and then also verses 27 and 28 in chapter 4. It's all of chapter 3 and a good chunk of chapter 4. Before we get into the text itself, <clears throat> excuse me, it can be helpful to look at Moses' life in terms of three sections, three distinct uh, time periods in his life. The first 40 years were his time in Egypt, growing up as a child, obviously into young adulthood, and then up to 40 years. He ran away from Egypt after killing the Egyptian at age 40, and he went out to the wilderness and became the shepherd for what ultimately was his father-in-law, Jethro, and that was from age 40 to age 80. And then 80 to 120 are the 40 years then that he led the children of Israel. Three very distinct time periods in Moses' life, easily broken down and helpful to keep in mind and to remember. So last time in our last lesson, our last account, Moses was born. So we've obviously gone through quite a bit of history um, between that lesson and this one. Now he's in the wilderness tending the, the sheep and the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro. So just the probably the main thing to mention in that interspaced time is the fact that the Egyptians had enslaved Israel. We heard about that at the beginning of last lesson and that Moses killed an Egyptian who was beating um, an Israelite worker. That prompted him to flee and therefore um, we find him now in the wilderness tending his father-in-law's sheep. In verse one, we hear that Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and Mount Sinai is also referred to as the mountain of God. There are some who look at these as two different mountains, but the greater um, number of people and everything in the text seems to point to that Horeb and Sinai are two names for the same mountain. And we'll see how that comes into play in a little bit later in chapter three, or excuse me, chapter four as well. So Moses is there, and then verse 2 of chapter 3, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. There are um, three phrases to look at, and again, if you're watching on video, you can see them highlighted in red and underlined. If you're not um, watching a video and you're listening to the audio of this, the angel of the Lord in verse 2 and that's who is appearing to Moses. In verse 4, the beginning of verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, and in verse 6, he said, I am the God of your father. This is one of the examples in the Old Testament, going back to verse 2, the angel of the Lord. One of the examples in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord is actually referring to God himself. And we can really draw more of a, co a connection to referring to the Son of God before he took on flesh and blood. So the eternal Son of God eventually took on flesh and blood and became, as we know, Jesus. But before that incarnation, before taking on flesh and blood, he's referred to at times in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. 
there are some contexts as well where the angel of the Lord is referring to an angel, just kind of a, an ordinary angel, probably not really an ordinary angel, but a, but a non-God angel uh, that the Lord sent. Context is what will tell us if the angel of the Lord is referring to the Lord himself or to an angel, a created angel. Here, the context of verses four and six help us identify the angel of the Lord in verse two as God himself. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in verse two. The Lord saw him in verse four. And God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and so on in verse six. Verses four and six, there's no question that it's God who is speaking. And so we connect that back to verse two and find that here is one of the contexts where the angel of the Lord does refer to God himself. And also noting that the angel of the Lord, Lord here is again, all in caps in ESV, which is the translation we're using. Most translations do do that, referring to Jehovah, Yahweh. We saw that back in Genesis as well. So God appears to Moses in this bush that's burning, but not being consumed. Verse three, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. God's going to talk to Moses. The burning bush was essentially an attention getter. There are other examples of this in scripture as well, most notably uh, on the day of Pentecost. The sound of a mighty rushing wind caught people's attention. They ran to see what was going on. They saw what looked to be tongues of fire on the disciples' heads. And then the most important thing of that day was they heard the wonderful works of God in their own languages so they could hear the gospel and be brought to faith. Here, the bush is amazing. It's an attention getter, but the most important thing isn't the bush that doesn't burn up. That got Moses' attention. The most important thing is what God is going to tell Moses um, from the bush. So verse four, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he, God said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. One of just a quick side note here with, with uh, translations of the Bible, the ESV, which again is what we're using here, does not capitalize divine pronouns. The new King James does and as do some of the other translations. The reason why this translation does not is that technically speaking, capitalizing pronouns to indicate that they're referring to God is interpretive. It is the translator saying this pronoun is God and it helps the reader then by capitalizing it. ESV chooses not to, not to add that layer of interpretation. Um, it's usually pretty obvious what the antecedent for the pronoun is, not always. It's helpful to see it capitalized. And so if you use a translation that shows that, you will, you'll see that. But in verse five, then he said, that is referring to God. And here where we have he Moses and he God, having it capitalized isn't a bad thing because that can definitely help in reading and understanding rather quickly who is doing the speaking. I just wanted to mention that depending on what translation you use and just explaining why he is not capitalized in the ESV in verse five. So God tells Moses, it's, it's holy ground, take off your sandals. Verse six, he, Moses, I'm sorry, verse six, he, still God, said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God, humbly understanding his role as a sinner. And here he is convinced very much so that he is face to face talking to God. By identifying himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God immediately identified for Moses that he is that true God of the Old Testament, the creator, the covenant God who had made that promise to Abraham in each succeeding generation um, ever since, including down to Moses' time. It's helpful to notice uh, there's no question that Moses truly believed he was talking to God, which he was, but he knows he's talking to God, which is an interesting thing to keep in the back of our minds as we go forward and see how Moses objects to what God is telling him. Starting in verse seven, God then gives Moses the background 
of what's to come next. So the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, the heavy, burdensome slavery. I know their sufferings. I missed one of the uh, verbs here of what God is doing when I was highlighting the things that God is doing. So I've seen, I've heard, I know their sufferings. I've come down to deliver them and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But looking at verses seven through eight, just see all the things that God is doing. He's describing the background, but what he's in, I've seen, I've heard, I know, I've come to deliver them, and I've come to bring them to the, the promised land. This is worth keeping in mind for what comes ahead years down the road in time and chapters down the road in, in scripture. When the children of Israel, at times in their complaining, bring up the idea, Moses, you and God just brought us out of Egypt to just die here in the wilderness. Better that we would have stayed in Egypt in slavery where we at least had food and so on. That was not true. But there is a two piece or two components to this, getting them out of Egypt and out of slavery and to the promised land. Now the Israelites are going to eventually charge God with saying, yeah, sure, you delivered us out of Egypt, but what have you done for us lately? You've got us out here in the wilderness and we're gonna die. It's a false charge and completely wrong, but they recognize the two components, getting out, getting to. Here God is very clear in saying, I'm gonna do both. I see, I hear, I know, I'm going to get you out of Egypt, but I'm going to bring you to the land flowing with milk and honey, to the promised land. Verse 9, now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. They've been crying out, pleading for deliverance, and I have also seen the oppression which the, with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And then we get into this dialogue, starting in verse 10, a dialogue between God and Moses. God is calling Moses to be the leader. Moses is doing everything he can to get out of it. If you're watching in the video, God is in purple and Moses is in orange. So God calls Moses, come, I will send you to Pharaoh with the goal that he would bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God, you've got the wrong guy. Who am I that I could possibly ever dream of doing that? God comes back and says, but I will be with you. In, in a sense, God is agreeing with Moses. Yeah, on your own, Moses, who are you that you would go to Pharaoh? You can't go to him on your own. You aren't going to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, but don't worry. I will be with you. And God goes on. I'm going to give you a sign. This shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. That's what I mentioned earlier, where we can definitely equate this with Mount Sinai, because later on, when they get out of Egypt, they do go to Mount Sinai and spend a couple of years there, and God gives the Ten Commandments and so forth. But that was a sign. I'm going to prove to you, uh, Moses, that I'm going to be with you, because you're going to come back to this very spot with the people, and you will serve me on this mountain. God calls, Moses says, who am I? God says, I'll be with you. It's going to be great. It'll be fine, or more than fine. Moses now is going to object to that. If I come, versus, this is verse 13. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So who am I supposed to say sent me? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, and again, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. In God's identification, a couple of things. First of all, in the identification, I am who I am. I simply am. I am the God who is. Every other God is a false God. Every other God has a beginning and created in some fashion by mankind. But I am. I am the eternal God. I exist. I am God. Done. That's it. 
it's, it's somewhat similar to Genesis 1-1 when God opens up the Bible with the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's no question. It's not in the beginning, here's how God came into existence. It's not in the beginning, now there was a God, let me tell you about him. It was simply assumes the fact. In the beginning, God, boom, done. And here too, I am who I am. I'm God. End of story. End of discussion. But to help the Israelites, God also then identifies himself as he did to Moses at the burning bush at first. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this God of covenant. The children of Israel in Egypt who were faithful to God's word would know immediately who this God was because it is the God of their history, the, the true God who created the heavens and the earth, the God of this promise beginning with Abraham. And another, going fast forward to the New Testament, another side um, cross-reference is when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, the Mary knew her Old Testament scripture. So as soon as Gabriel started talking about this promised Messiah, she made the, the connection and would have known a uh, descendant of David is, was the key part there in Gabriel to Mary. Immediately, this is going to be the Messiah. So it's a great example that identifying God by what he has done and promised in the past is what God does for Moses, what God says, Moses, you should do for the children of Israel, and ultimately what Gabriel did for Mary as well. Going back to that word of God and seeing what God has said and using that as his identification. So uh, in verse 16, then, God continues with teaching Moses what he should say when he goes to the children of Israel. Verse 16, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, and so forth has appeared to me. And then God recounts for Moses in verse 16 and 17, repeat to them what, what I have told you here. Jumping to verse 18, and they will listen to your voice. Now, we're not done yet with Moses' objections in this text, but just so far, see what's happened. God said, I'm going to call you. Moses says, yeah, but who am I? God says, I'll be with you. And Moses says, yeah, but what should I say? Who sent me? Excuse me. And God says, I'll tell you who you can say sent you, me, and they will listen to your voice. Now, this is where it begins to become important to remember that Moses, when he was first called by God out of the burning bush, he knew this was the true God that he was speaking to. He hid his face. There's no question in Moses' mind who this is. But his, his unwillingness, his sinful unwillingness and fear and other things probably are leading him to object. So he's questioning God. He's challenging God. And again and again, God says, I'm calling you. I'm sending you they will listen to your voice. God tells Moses, don't be afraid. They will listen. And then he goes on in verse 18, you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt. Now here's the game plan. You go to the Israelites, tell them that I sent you what you're doing. Then you and the elders go to the king of Egypt and say to him, um, this is still verse 18, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he'll let you go. These are the things that we know as the ten plagues and is the next lesson. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you shall not go empty." But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. We'll come back to this again in the next lesson, but this plundering the Egyptians is uh, very much the getting the payment, almost as it were, for all that slave labor. Plundering the Egyptians, taking the wealth with them, and that would sustain them going forward. But here God lays out in advance all that's going to happen. And he says, this is how it's going to be. They will listen. You and the elders go and tell Pharaoh, he's not going to let you go until I, until I strike him with the plagues. But when you do go, you're going to take the wealth of Egypt with you. That gets us through chapter three. But the account continues in chapter four. Just a little bit of an odd break chapter wise. So that was God's latest statement in this dialogue with Moses. Now Moses comes back again, again with another objection. But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. This is a flat-out contradiction of God. 
Moses is completely opposing what God said. Because you go back to chapter 3 and verse 18, they will listen to your voice. Now Moses says, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. Moses is now not just insecure in what he can or cannot do. He is flat out contradicting God, who's speaking to him from the bush. God then says to him, verse 2 of chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, and he's going to give now three signs. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it down, becomes a snake. Moses picks it up again, becomes a rod again. That's the first sign, the rod into a snake. And so God tells him to do this in verse five with the goal that they may believe. These signs that God gives to Moses to reinforce that God really had sent him to convince the people of Israel they are not dissimilar to Jesus' miracles. In the New Testament, Jesus did miracles certainly to help people, but that was not the primary goal, really. The miracles were signs to show Jesus' power. They were signs to establish the truth that he was the Son of God. It was to prove the authority that Jesus had to what he was speaking. And what he preached and taught was the most important here, too, the signs are, are wonderful and amazing, but they are to serve a purpose, a goal, that they may believe. So God is equipping Moses with still more to convince the people of Israel, should they be doubtful. <clears throat> Verse 6, the second sign, Moses was to put his hand inside his, his cloak, literally his bosom, so into his chest, um, and put his, pull his hand out and it would come out leprous, full of leprosy. And then he could put it back in to his chest and it would come out clean. Verse eight, God says, if they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. Verse nine, if they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, here's one more. A third sign, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground water to blood. That would also become one of the plagues um, when we get to the 10 plagues. At this point, from the position of us looking back at this, we might well say, well, Moses, just quit objecting already and just do. Go forward. Be brave. Be strong. Be courageous. But Moses has some more objections to raise. And if we were in the same position, we may very well find ourselves in the same weak state as Moses. But after all that, verse 10, Moses says, but Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. Can't speak well, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. It is possible that Moses actually did have some kind of speech impediment, that this wasn't made up, but it still is an excuse. It's still Moses trying to get out of what God is calling him to do. And so he uses whatever to whatever legitimacy there was to the speech impediment, his lack of eloquence. He says, I can't do it. But then God responds, verse 11, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. There is an answer and a providing of what Moses needs at every turn. God says, I'll be with you. They will listen to you. I'll give you signs. I will give you the words to speak. And I, by the way, made your mouth. Think about it from this perspective. God was calling Moses. God made Moses. God knew what Moses' gifts, abilities, weaknesses were, and he still called him. When God called him to do this, God wasn't ignorant of anything about Moses, and God was still calling him, which tells us and really tells Moses, if God's calling you, He's, no, he knows what you're bringing to the table, and he will give you what you need to fulfill what God is calling you to do. Simply put, God does not call us into any situation where we can't go forward with him. God doesn't call us into something and say, well, good luck. I'm, I'm out of this. Not anything close to that. When God calls, he equips. And so God, again, says, okay, so you're, you're not eloquent. I've got that covered, too. Verse 13, one more objection from Moses. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. That really gets down now, finally, to the bottom line. Moses has run out of excuses. 
He's run out of all of his insecurities, all his beliefs of what could be problematic about this mission, so to speak. And so he comes down to what is really underlying the whole thing. I don't want to do it. Please send someone else. This is not for me. Verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you will do the signs. Um, Aaron is, is put in a position by God, ultimately called to be Moses' mouthpiece. And a prophet is literally a mouthpiece for God. So Moses is God's prophet. God gives him the words, Moses speaks. Aaron is effectively Moses' prophet. Moses gives Aaron the words, and Aaron speaks for Moses. So they would be a team, and they would remain that way throughout their lives, or throughout the rest of their lives, and the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And now it's done. Now Moses, go. So Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, asked for release. Verse 20, he took his wife and his sons, and they went to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. And then verse 27 and 28, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. This is a little bit of backstory to get Aaron to meet Moses. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. And now they're ready to go to Pharaoh and the people in Egypt, um, people of Israel first and then Pharaoh, and then ultimately be delivered. Just to briefly touch on some of the lessons keys. First of all, when God calls, he equips. It's true for a call to a particular office. That's true for Moses being called to be the leader of Israel. To, to this day, it still works that way when God calls individuals into, public, into the public ministry, um, pastor, teachers, or even congregational leaders, he calls to a specific office. And if he called someone to that office, he will equip in spite of whatever weaknesses we may bring. And he also calls us to a calling in life. And depending on the age of your children, this could be one place to spend a little bit of time in application. Um, as children get older, um, they will start to consider, prayerfully consider what their careers will be, what they will um, study and so forth. And when we keep in mind that God calls us into these roles, sometimes to the public ministry, which is something wonderfully, um, which is a wonderful thing to encourage if the gifts are there but also other callings and to steer our children to look at and to learn and to see the gifts that God has given them and encourage them to explore those things. So not approaching eventual career and life, um, life study from a standpoint of what's going to get me a lot of money, not what's going to give me prestige, but let me look and see, and to parents, children can say, help me to see what are my gifts? What has God given me? And what will he perhaps call me to? Exploring our gifts that we have, building them, looking for new ones. That's what God uses to call us into various callings in life. And it goes beyond career. It, calling as um, sons and daughters, calling as uh, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives. All the different roles that we play are different vocations, different callings from God. And in none of them, none of them does God call without equipping. And then um, the third one, similar as well, there can be times where God will allow troubles to come into our lives, call us effectively to a season of sorrow, a season of struggle, um, difficulty. And if God calls us and allows us to face hardships, he will equip us in those two. A passage that could be brought in here as well as from Corinthians, God will not allow us to be tested beyond what we're able to bear, but with the temptation also make a way to escape. And a second point, too, just noticing how Moses' objections contradict God and how God graciously answers every one of Moses' needs. The, this account shows very matter-of-factly that God provided for Moses. The insecurities were real to Moses, the, tr the troubles, the doubts, the apprehensions. Would they listen to him? All of that was legitimate from a human standpoint. But God answered every one of them and equipped Moses to fulfill the calling. That is the uh, time spent in Exodus 3 and 4 for this lesson. 
We pray that this will be helpful as you continue to study these words and prepare to share them with your children in the Sunday School lessons. And if you are watching this as a parent um, for the at-home Sunday School, um, please do take advantage of the resource of your teachers if you have any questions or if they can be of service in any way. And may God continue to, to bless your time spent in his word.